Good morning, everyone. I'm Alicia and I have Eric here and we are exposing mold here on Wellness Wednesday to talk about the evolution of mold illness. Eric, please take it away. You have been in the game for so long. You've seen every manifestation of this um, since it begun. So please let us know what's going on in this in this field. Well, you have to remember that back in 1985, a lot of doctors were trying to figure out the origin of chronic fatigue syndrome, the original incident, <clears throat> clusters of teachers in sick buildings, which were known to be sick at the time, uh, casino workers, all working in a moldy basement. Um, they couldn't figure it out. I mean, they were told it was mold and they couldn't figure it out. It was documented in newspapers and books, videos, uh, Osler's Web, that the Truckee teachers, when they couldn't get the CDC to respond to their request to look into the room, they said, well, then just look into the filters, check the filters. So they clearly knew that whatever was to be found was going to be in the filters. So that was the suspicion was mold. And despite all the claims of people um, saying they want to look into chronic fatigue syndrome, they want to solve the mystery. For years and years and years, nobody came forward and said, I think I know what that is. So I, I took that to mean that nobody knew about toxic mold. And that's why I stepped up to tell people about it. And um, this is borne out by the literature because the indoor air quality experts who were examining sick buildings, they didn't know about mold. So it's quite reasonable that the CDC and chronic fatigue syndrome researchers failed because there was absolutely nothing in the literature. All the doctors that people went to about this time were saying, no, mold can't do that. And for decades after that, there was no belief from family, from friends, society in general, just had no space, airspace for even discussing this kind of thing. So the question for me is, did mold change? Did it become worse? Did it move from something that was fairly benign to something that now was an airborne inhalant hazard? All the evidence says yes mold really changed sometime in the 1980s. Whole time I was growing up, we thought of mold as hazardous, but only if you ate it. And certainly not something that you could inhale and get sick from. That was just an allergy. So that's what I talk about when I say um, that mold has assumed a new pathogenesis and there's an effect to be examined here. Since my attention was drawn to this strange new way that mold was acting, and it seemed to be an inhalant problem, I looked for clues. One of them that I described in Dr. Richie Shoemaker's books is that if I passed through the bad zone, the areas that were making me uh, sick, not just in the sick buildings, but from a storm drain as well, that my own breath would make me sick in the middle of the night. I'd wake up feeling like my own breath was incredibly toxic and I had to move away from wherever I was breathing. I could contaminate my pillow. I had to move away from it. This wasn't described in the medical literature. I've never heard of anybody talking about anything, anything like this before. So this was over and above what we considered mold to be capable of doing. So that's what I focused on. How is it possible that we could inhale something, get it stuck in our lungs, and then have it come back out later more toxic than when it went in? So that's mainly what I mean by the effect, something that's clearly different. And this is not like a normal toxin in, in the sense that it's not that bad on the first breath. When you're uptaking this stuff, it doesn't 
let you know instantly that it's all that terrible, but it does later. So one of the ways I could test this is that after people had been in the bad zone, I could get near them and find out whether or not they were complaining of symptoms later and whether I could sense something coming from them, from their bodies, from their contaminated clothing and from their breath. So I did many, many experiments. And sure enough, even though we were out in the woods, far away from any bad places, I could sense that they were exuding this toxic emission. There were many other ways to check this as well. For example, uh, when people were having meetings of the mystery illness support group, I would get there first and wait for the room to fill up. I would get a sense of how the room felt and people would come in and as more and more people arrived, the room would feel worse and worse. In fact, some people were so incredibly toxic that one person walking in could fill the room with badness, make the room feel like it was a sick building. I did this experiment so many times. I even did it at the uh, Whittemore Peterson Institute grand opening in 2010 as chronic fatigue syndrome researchers and patients showed up. The room that had felt good initially just kept getting worse and worse until finally it was almost unbearable. And then some people, just exactly as in the original mystery illness, were so toxic, so bad, that even getting near them, others could sense it. And you could tell because there could be somebody in the middle of a group and people would kind of step away from them. And then the uh, daughter of the Whittemores hugged somebody in a wheelchair. And just from that, staggered over and said, oh, I feel so sick, I can hardly stand up. We had to get her outside for 15 minutes before she could carry on with the inauguration ceremonies. So that's how mold is different than it used to be. And specifically, this rebreathe effect that I talk about is the telltale sign to it. Can I um, ask you a few questions, Eric? Absolutely. So before CFS came neuromyasthenia, was that was that considered also like a mold issue or like unbeknownst to mold issue? There, there's a um, video segment called The Disease of a Thousand Names, where for the last hundred years, people have made up a succession of different names for what appears to be a very similar illness. Yeah. And neurasthenia from the 1800s was one of the earliest. Neuromyasthenia was an attempt to improve on that, add in the myasthenia for muscle pain, make it sound a little more serious. Mm -hmm. And then there was the epidemic neuromyasthenia, mm -hmm. where the same type of illness seemed to happen both sporadically and in outbreak fashion. So it required two different names. Mm -hmm. And it was Alexis Shelikov, I believe, who in 1950s, about 1956, 1955, came up with the term neuromyasthenia and epidemic neuromyasthenia to try to sort this out. So the question for me was, can I look back in the documented reports of epidemic neuromyasthenia and find mold clues? None were reported. But they did say that these epidemic neuromyasthenia outbreaks tended to occur in an instit institutional setting like a hospital or a building or even, a, I mean, some kind of school. Like many outbreaks would start out in a school. Dr. Byron Hyde reported that in his early works on myalgic encephalomyelitis. So even though there's no reports of mold per se, the clues that something in the sick building made the difference are there clear to be seen. It's really interesting. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, you guys. So you basically, from your investigation, all of these outbreaks are happening in buildings, but again, kind of almost like CFS, you know, mold wasn't exact, exactly documented per se, but 
maybe mold did play a factor in that. So, you know, it, it's, it went through all these names, you know, the, the, the neurasthenia, <clears throat> the neuromyasthenia, the CFS, now it's what, SIRS. And what was interesting that um, <clears throat> we have an upcoming podcast episode with um, a guy who's not a believer that mold illness is real. And that's going to be airing next week on Monday. And he basically made the claim of bacteria. I think he made the claim of bacteria being the problem in buildings. But that was something that was investigated in the beginning before mold, right, Eric? It was like Legionnaire's disease, all these bacterial agents as an issue until they found the mold. Absolutely. In fact, mold was a stronger suspect many, many years before mold was. And they were speculating that staph and strep super antigens were the culprit. And then they did do many studies on actinomycetes, which has been thoroughly investigated and is used for production of all kinds of useful uh, pharmaceuticals. There is so much litter on actinomycetes that it seemed impossible that anything that was so well studied would have failed to be incorporated into the sick building syndrome paradigm. I'm, I understand that it's not all that difficult to find. It's um, actinomycetes is a filamentous bacteria that looks a lot like mold, but considering all the mold studies that have been done, one would think with all these thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of examinations of mold, that these researchers looking at toxic mold would wonder, why is this damned filamentous bacteria getting in my way? Get it out of here and stop to consider, could this have anything to do with it? So it seems that Dr. Shoemaker's premise is that for all this time, it was getting in the way and was completely overlooked. Considering how doctors have managed to overlook the toxic mold issue, I guess that's not impossible. It seems like they can overlook just about anything. However, to use this new focus on actinomycetes as a reason to throw out all the information that we have on toxic mold, that's a giant step backwards. The toxins, the mycotoxins from Stachybotrys in particular, the trichothecenes, they've never been disproved. They're still relevant. They're capable of causing illness. We know that. So why throw them off the cliff in favor of this new bug on the block? Yeah, we're starting to see a shift though, right, Eric? We're seeing a shift where his organization is still looking at mold as as a primary issue. So maybe the, we'll, there will be another turnaround. I don't know. Maybe they'll want to look closer into this. But I just want to recap what you mentioned about the evolution of mold illness. And you basically said that it was something that started in buildings and people were getting sick from molded buildings to where we are now, where, you know, if people had gotten sick in a building back in the day, they could simply leave that building and be okay. But now we're seeing a different evolution of this illness uh, occur in a way where um, mere molecules on people's breath, you know, or clothing or, or God, items, you know, from your house, whether it's metal, plastic, cloth, um, is still causing reactivity and, and keeping people sick. Um, and so we're, we're seeing this evolution of change in this illness. And I think that's where exposing mold is really unique is where we're noting this change and we're also adapting to this particular change. Um, I feel like Amy Skilton in episode 90 of the Exposing Mold podcast um, was on point with how she felt with the shoemaker protocol. I asked her a question, you know, what do you think about the shoemaker, shoemaker protocol and, and how it's um, helping patients now? Like, is this still effective? And in terms of testing, you know, it's great. Awesome. We see that the, it, the system is inflamed, but the treatment methods are outdated and it's not really helping people now and in the way that their illness has been manifested from this. Um, and so I think that's where avoidance has always stood the test of time um, with this illness. You know, if you're in a burning building, you're not going to stay in that burning building and expect to survive. Um, you have to 
get out of that situation. Uh, you have to get away from the offender that's causing the health issues. Um, and so I just wanted to know your thoughts on that, Eric, um, in terms of just mold illness treatments now um, and, and kind of where we're going in the future with this. Well, the um, tendency is to try to define an illness by what cures it. And there's a lot of illnesses that have no cure. So that really makes no sense. You define a, a problem, an illness, by what it is, what it's doing, not by what doctor claims to have the greatest protocol for it. And when people complain about sick buildings and they move out and take their possessions with them and are still sick, this is something that wasn't previously described in the literature. So you look at it from that point of view. What's going on? Why are these possessions that bad? Why is there inflammatory response so upregulated that these mere molecules keep people sick. One would think that if this had occurred in the past, if people moved and their possessions kept them ill, they would notice just as people are noticing it now. I've been to symposiums and pointed this out and they attempt to tell me, well, we're smarter then. Our ancestors were stupid. They, they weren't capable of noticing that they were sick because they brought contaminated things with them. Somehow, I, I have a tough time believing that. And if this toxic mold phenomenon had manifested in the way it is now, what about cases where people couldn't get out? You'd have an entire room or an entire building full of sick people, and it's really hard to overlook, especially if it's like a battleship, something during World War II, where all the sailors couldn't just get up and leave. Yet we don't have reports of any ships taken out of service because all their sailors were too sick to perform their duties. This is just not something that showed up in the literature. And yet it's happening in sick buildings left and right. We've got whole schools that are being closed down, hospitals being evacuated, all kinds of places of employment where people can no longer work. This is not something that you could easily overlook. So I don't think that our ancestors were so incapable of recognizing it, that that's what happened, which puts it into the mold probably changed paradigm. I was just going to ask you that, actually, that was literally on the tip of my tongue. Like the change in illness is, is because of this, because of the fungi evolving in their potency. I mean, what are your thoughts around that? Well, there were some doctors who were cognizant of this upregulated response, but they always shift the blame over to a virus. They say, okay, the virus weakened your immune system and now you're reacting to everything. And that has been where it stayed at for 35 years. Dr. Cheney and Dr. Peterson were willing to consider that. But that's what they'd say straight out, is that it was the virus that left you open to everything else. Well, is this true? The Incline Village is a pretty small town, so it's like a microcosm. It was easy to test. All I had to do was look at people who didn't have the mystery illness, didn't have the virus, observe as they went into the bad places, and see if they had a response, which they did. So I went back to chronic fatigue syndrome researchers and explained, it's not just us. There are healthy people, healthy controls who are also being affected by these buildings and not just in a transient manner. Once these people have a really bad response to these buildings, they seem to be left hypersensitive. They can tell if they're in a bad building from then on. So even though those of us who got the mystery virus, the Tahoe flu, we were the sickest. This paradigm goes beyond just the viral infection. There's something about the sick buildings that is getting worse. And where do you see us um, going from here in the future? Well, look at Australia. Years ago, there were no reports of mold illness in Australia. None, nothing. No mold doctors at all. It was completely unknown. 
I don't know why they're 20 years behind us in becoming aware of this. Is there a different pollutant, a different um, bacteria, cofactor, some, something? I don't know. But for some reason, it emerged in certain hotspots in the USA seemingly before anywhere else. I have my theory about that, which I call the nanoparticle theory, a certain type of pollution that seems to be becoming prevalent. But that's just a bizarre speculative theory. But what we do know is that if you look at the reports of where mold complaints emerged in a really huge way, we have gone from zero in Australia only 10, 15 years ago to huge, vast number of sick people now. So where do I see us going in the future? Well, at this rate of pro progression, I can see entire cities being abandoned in the very near future, maybe even as little as 10 or 15 years. And even beyond that, certain regions seem to be problematic. I wonder what that's going to look like for mold avoidance in the future. Everyone's going to be fighting for pristine, clean locations. Yeah, the desert that nobody wanted to live in is now the hot place to be. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We're in the desert now, so we're enjoying that. <laughs> well, this was a great conversation, Eric. Was there anything else that you wanted to add to round out for today's discussion? Well, I wanted to mention about this rebreathing effect. There's something about it that emerges in the middle of the night. Uh, a lot of people complain that between one and three in the middle of the night, they wake up just feeling wretched. And I think this has to do with the uh, atmospheric effects, the ion shift. Now, like I say, this is just a bizarre speculation, but we know that the prevalence of positive ions shifts in favor of negative ions in the middle of the night as the uh, upper atmosphere changes in response to the warming rays of the sun hitting the very top of the atmosphere. Now, ion researchers actually talked about positive ion pollution increasing in uh, congruence with man-made um, substances that destroy negative ions. And they actually predicted that these types of syndromes would emerge prior to the viral illnesses becoming detected by chronic fatigue syndrome researchers. They made very accurate observations of who is going to become reactive to electronics, to television sets, to electromagnetic frequencies? And they called it before it happened. So when I saw that the worst time of night and the rebreathing effect or the exhalation of these toxic uh, things that I had absorbed during the day occurred during the ion shift, uh, this is what I wanted to get research into because avoidance of that specific time of night and what I ex exhale, making sure that once I breathe something out and contaminate my pillow, or even just have this invisible cloud in front of me for this short time in the middle of the night has given me more bang for the buck than just about anything else I've done. So it'd be probably, it'd be worthwhile to have people watch for that. Do they wake up in the middle of the night? Do they feel like their pillow is contaminated? And report back to us. Tell us what they think. That's awesome. Thank you for calling that out to our audience members here. Um, I did, we were working on some content in our private members group. For those of you who are interested, we're actually doing how-to videos on this stuff. So how to embark on a mold hiatus, aka sabbatical, how to do this rebreathe experiment. Um, everything is being produced in video form and also PDF format for you guys. Um, so that way, everyone who learns and they're all, you know, all type of ways, whether you're a visual learner, reader, whatever, it's, it's accessible for you and available for you to learn these skills, because we definitely think that 
This is highly critical and highly important for recovery for those who are failing on the Shoemaker Protocol, on your naturopath's protocols, are getting sicker on these different types of protocols and not finding any relief. Um, so this type of information is extremely important. And our organization, it really, we really move by the proverb. What's that proverb, Eric? Uh, give a man a fish, they eat for a day. Teach a man a fish and they eat for a lifetime. I mean, we're really about education and providing this information to you so that way you can put these skills to, to practice in your life and to help you overcome uh, mold or, or at least help you control your reactions and, and gain some, some normalcy back in your life. So that's what we're committed to. So if you are interested in signing up, please check us out, patreon.com slash exposing mold. Again, we are changing our prices next month. <clears throat> Sorry, pardon me. Our prices are going to be raising next month. Um, so please lock yourself in in an incredibly low rate now. And I do apologize for my little dots. I'm getting ready for the, this is my Wakanda forever makeup. <laughs> the Black Panther movie's coming up. No, it's from my, my lights over here. But um, I appreciate you guys uh, just tuning in and listening to us chat about this stuff because it's so important. And uh, for, as far as I know, no one else is having these type of conversations. So it's really interesting to sit with Eric, pick his brain because he's been around for a while <clears throat> and has seen this evolve into something that was easily escapable to now inescapable. Um, so thank you, everyone. And we will see you guys next time.